Thank you very much uh, for coming to today's class. And we're moving on now to finish up the section on public administration and ethical leadership. If you remember, we divide up the public sector, public sector. Normally in Western thinking, which is not totally applicable for the Middle East, we divide up our lives into two, uh, two sections or two spheres, if you will, your private life and your public life. The public life is made up of government, business, and civil society. The private sector is religion and family. I'm not saying this is correct. I'm just saying this is the traditional way it's done in Western academia, which obviously does not work in the Middle East because this strict distinction between the two does not exist. We see this easily with the family status courts, where issues of marriage, divorce, child custody, inheritance are not in the governmental sector, but in the religious sector. So this, this distinction does not apply to the Middle East, but uh, just so you're aware of it, this is the thinking behind it, right? When you're, when you're wondering why religion is not in this section here, for example. So, the point I made was that this article is about govern the governmental section, sector, but it applies equally to business and to civil society. And let's just quickly review what are some of the key players or key institutions that are part of civil society. Civil society is not the state, and it's not business, it's, non it's non-profit. So what are some of the civil society NGOs. organizations? CSO is a term that's relatively recent. So NGOs, which are non-governmental organizations. For example, give me an example. Save the Children, Red Cross, Caritas, whatever. OK. What else? The educational sector. Media, those are the three major ones. NGOs, educational sector, and the media. So universities are part of civil society. So let's move on now to finish up this article. We skipped a little bit ahead to have a look at the issue of whistleblowers. Let's move back now in the reading to yeah, to the moral action. Moral action. Uh, I noticed that there is an uh, overabundance of engineers in this class. Uh, so there will be no problem with the concept of triangulation. What is it? So, can someone raise their hand, please, so we can have an orderly discussion? What is triangula triangulation? Right. Three coordinates. Can you use four? No. You could. Would it make it worse? Yes. No, it wouldn't make it worse. It just wouldn't add anything. Right. So triangulation because the world is three-dimensional, right? So we use this concept in the social sciences as well. And as in the case of engineering or in physics, we do not have to limit it to three. So triangulation could be four or five or six, depending on whether it adds anything or not. In, in the area of moral action, what is the triangulation that you see in the reading? Can somebody point it out? There's three things that go, it talks about a moral triangle on page, uh, ethical triangle, excuse me, on page uh, seven or 34 in the, in the book. 
What is an ethical triangle? Right, virtue, principles, and duties. Okay, now, duty is a tricky issue because doing your duty might be unethical. Can you give me an example? Can someone give me an example? Okay, you could, well, that's unethical for some people, but if you're in the army, shooting the enemy is not unethical. It's not, but uh, pacifists would argue it's unethical. Uh, the same example we gave last time about following the Nazis' orders. Okay, the, the legal system within the Third Reich, within Hitler's Nazi regime, was duty based. But the people who followed the rules in many cases were sentenced to long jail sentences or to death because they're, the duty based issue, our approach can be based on improper duties or improper rules. So if, if you're a member of an organization which, for example, says put loyalty before, what's the dilemma? Truth, put loyalty before truth, then in this case, duty-based wouldn't work because you would say truth is more important to me than, than duty. So duty-based is important. We sign up for a, a football team, we sign up for a club, and it has rules. We register at NDU, and there are rules. You, you, you agree by signing up to obey them. So, second issue, virtue. What is the difference between virtue and principles? I'll, I'll read this because it has to go on, on the tape. It's on page 34 or 7 with the handwriting. Virtue-based approach concentrates on what's what a good person would do in, a high, in this highly intuitive. Virtue is actually a concept that comes from the Renaissance. The Renaissance being, what is the Renaissance? But please raise your hand when you want to, yes. Okay, and what came after the Renaissance? We had the Dark Ages, then we had the Renaissance, and then we had... After the Dark Ages, we had the... The, the Light Ages, or what's that called? The Enlightenment. Okay, just a second. Before we go any further, I would like to point something out to you, guys. When we use terms like Dark Ages and Enlightenment. You said the Dark Ages. Is that a neutral term? Okay, it's specific only to Europe, but is it in Europe a neutral term? Why not? Yeah, and, and who was in charge of European society during the Dark Ages? The church. And who was in charge of European society during the Enlightenment? Gradually. The middle classes, the bourgeoisie, the business gr groups. So guess who made that distinction, that dichotomy, those two terms, Dark Ages versus Enlightenment? Whose terms are they? Yeah, the, the, people, the people who called their own time Enlightenment called the period of the church. Remember we had the two, the two spheres? So when we put religion in the private sphere and say when religion goes in the public sphere, it's the Dark Ages, that's not neutral. So be aware, a lot of the terms we're using here are loaded. So that, that just for one. So in the Renaissance, what, is, what does it mean? No, Renaissance means re, rebor, rebirth. So what was reborn? The thinking of who, 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 whose thinking was reborn? No, the, 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 okay, and, okay, well, we're not going to go through the Renaissance. The Renaissance is the rebirth of ancient Greek and Roman culture. Ancient Greek and Roman culture. And the concept of virtue was a very important Greek classical concept. The virtue is what's inborn, what's, what, what's, what, is what, is what is in you. It's what makes you who you are. So your virtue is very personal. So 
as opposed to duty-based, we have virtue, which is your personal inborn values. Who so far have we heard of who believes that these personal inborn values are very important? Did we deal with anybody so far? Barnabe, who else? Hammerskjold, Hammerskjold. This is the whole point. The, the post-conventional level is strongly related to virtue. But it's, it's not related to duty-based. It's, it's virtue and it's also principles, which is the, fir the third thing. Principles, principle-based approach guides the administrator in what is the right to do. While this approach may be useful for the public administrator because it relies on a broader perception, et cetera, et cetera. It's sets of values as opposed to sets of rules. What is the difference between a, a set of values and a set of rules? Can anybody give me a, a shot? A, someone else? Please raise your hand. OK, please. What's the difference between values and rules? No, that would be virtue. That would be virtue. The values. The values are good. Yes. I think values are the uh, common experience. The common sense values and the feel good. And your principles or your values, they're, they're broad. For example, honesty, reliability. These are not rules. Rules are, values are like a con constitution, whereas the rules are the, the laws upon which the Constitution then applies itself to society. What the point in the action-based approach is that we need to use all three. We triangulate between duty, virtue, and principles. So when all three of them meet, that's the right thing. When only two of them meet, it's questionable. So what this approach suggests is that we can use this triangulation approach to determine what's right or wrong. It's very practical as opposed to the previous two. The philosophical approach is, of course, very theoretical in that it is based a lot on speculation. What if there was a social contract? What if there was a veil of ign ignorance? Kohlberg is not speculative. It's not abstract because he does actually do research. What, what's the name of his research approach, one of the examples we had? The Heinz Dilemma. The Heinz Dilemma. And of course, this is very much uh, getting down now to, to real life. Okay, let's move on now to the issue of public participation. And here I would like you to have a look at your handout. The handout. We're now on page nine. You all have the handout, right? OK, you can write on this because you can print it out again in a clean copy. I would like you for, to, uh, for Thursday to give me one example of each one of these categories that we don't talk about in class. OK, so don't write the one that we're talking about in class. For example, charity. When we're talking about the interaction between institutions and society, or institutions and individuals, the oldest form of do-good behavior on the part of institutions is charity. What is charity? Giving without expecting anything in return. So caritas is Latin for charity. So you help people who are in need. And it's important to distinguish these seven levels because sometimes they're, all, they're confused. Charity. Can someone give an example besides caritas of a charitable organization? No, I wouldn't call the Red Cross chair. The uh, Red Cross is a service provider. SOS. SOS Children's. It's also, but it's also charity in the sense 
The Red Cross is, 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 a, is a semi intergovernmental organization. Okay. So the next, the next category, what comes, chron this is chronological by the way, chronological is through time. The next one is, okay, entrepreneurial, that's clear. Paternalism, what does it mean? Fatherliness. The university calls itself, calls itself a family. So what does this mean? The relationship between the leadership and the rest of the institution is like the relationship between a father and, its chil and the children. So paternalism means that the people who have power and influence feel responsible for everybody else the same way a parent feels responsible for the children. So the, some of you are uh, familiar with a Austrian company that sells things that looks like diamonds, but they're not, they're glass. Sierowski, okay. Sierowski is one of the best examples. 120, 130 years ago, they started something which really solved the problems for their workers. In the early industrial period, people, people who worked in factories did not have access to education, to health care, they didn't have good housing. They didn't have um, a structure to take care of their needs because they had moved from the country into the city and they were more or less on their own. So what does Sarovsky do? He creates affordable housing for his workers. He creates clinics for his workers and their families. He creates basic education for his workers' children because he feels like he's a father who is responsible for his employees. Who do you think was unhappy about this approach to the relationship between the boss and his workers? Well, you could say the, the competitors might be unhappy because his workers would be very loyal. But who else would be unhappy? Why, the, sh the shareholders would be happy because these workers are highly motivated. And he has an almost 100% retention rate, which means nobody's going to leave that company. Why? You're not going to get that deal anywhere else, right? So he has high motivation, high retention. Who's unhappy? Who, who says that they are the true representatives of workers? The unions. Are these workers going to join unions? No. They don't have any problems. So it was the unions who became very upset. What's the next category? Philanthropy, what does it mean? Do, it means the love of, of, of people, of humans. Okay, philanthropy is when a rich person or a rich organization gives to, for example, the Beirut Marathon. Who sponsors, who, who sponsors or who pays for the Beirut Marathon? The biggest one. The Bank of Beirut, is it, it was Blom, now it's, isn't is the Bank of Lebanon? And I, it's anyway, the banks. The banks are the big donors, let's not use the word sponsors, the big donors for the Beirut Marathon. Also big recipients are museums or social projects. Philanthropy, just keep this in mind, philanthropy is giving to good causes, not people in need necessarily. The people in the Beirut Marathon are not poor or disabled. It's not charity. It's helping society, helping mankind. Okay. Keep this in mind because it, it'll, there'll be a clear distinction between philanthropy and CSR, which is corporate social responsibility. Just keep this in mind. You can write, write on this because you have another copy on Blackboard or Facebook. Okay. Next one. The next category. Social partnership. Social partnership. But I think we had a question back there. Yes. Yes. So, uh, philanthropy is expressed by publicity. I don't know. We'll, we'll distinguish between philanthropy and sponsorship in a second. Okay. Okay. So, social partnership is the one that you're going to have a little bit of trouble with 
because it assumes powerful unions. Does anybody know what the ILO is? A good guess. Okay, L's not liberation. What else could it be? Labor. The International Labor Organization. It's not directly part of the United Nations, but it's very closely linked to the UN. And it's tripartite. Which means three parties. One party would be government. One party would be business. And one party would not be civil society, but labor. This has changed a lot because labor organizations are relatively weak now in many parts of the world. The labor unions, as you might know, were very influential before the beginning of the Civil War. Uh, they were very strong in countries like the US historically, but today they're very weak. But in Europe, especially in Central and Northern Europe, the labor unions are still very strong. And this tripartite approach is thriving. What it means is that government, labor, and business cooperate as equals. So for this kind of social partnership to exist in, at NDU, what would have to change? The student union is it seen as an equal by the professors and the administration? That's me, sorry. Okay, is the student union seen as an equal partner by the professors and the administration? Is anybody familiar with the role of the student union? You might, you might have been in it or... Has, does, does anybody know of a certain change that's taken place this year as opposed to last year with the role of the student union? Nobody knows. Hmm? The student union is now represented with two seats on all university committees. So I'm on the university research committee and we have one undergraduate member of the student union and then we have one graduate, graduate student who's not a member of the student union obviously, but we have two students now on each university level committee. What's the purpose of that? Right. To, when, we're, when we're drafting policies, for example, the policy on sponsored travel, when, you tr when, you, when professors go to a conference to present a paper, the university pays for it. Should the university pay for students who want to go to conferences? Yes. No. No? Yeah. Okay. So this is, an, this is an important issue. When we decide on that, whether students should get funding for travel to conferences, should the students have a voice? Of course. For the students to have a voice, first of all, we have to take them seriously, which means we have to give them seats on the committee. But what else has to happen? I'm, I'm, I'm talking about this because I'm experiencing this, experiencing this at this very moment. Am I talking slow enough now? Or is it still too fast? It's OK? Even slower? OK. So what do the students have to do if they're going to be serious players on the committees developing policies or rules, for example, funding for student travel for? They have, to have they have to have demands. Good. And what else do they have to have before they have demands? What do we know about Martin Luther King? What's the first step? Research. Research. Which means the students have to research the whole policy of sponsored or university uh, funded travel. The problem at the moment is that the students are not used to this yet. So for social partnership to work, it requires that the union, whether it's a labor union or a student union, actually does the research. So social partnership. This is, this is a, a, we'll, get, we'll get back to this later on when we talk about South Africa, because in South Africa, the unions are also very powerful. Next one. Sponsorship. sponsorship. OK, what's the difference between sponsorship and philanthropy? Sponsorship. Yeah. Wait, wait, somebody in the back, yeah. Yeah, okay. Please. Uh, sponsorship, you, when, when you sponsor an event or something, uh, you actually look for something back. Yeah, you, 
What do you want back? What, what do you do? Yes. Wait, 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 wait. Okay, yeah? Advertisements. So you, you put your name on the t-shirt. So, so you, it's basically a form of advertising as opposed to philanthropy. If a rich person pays for 30% of the budget of the National Museum, he'll put a little plaque in the corner. But people are not, are not going to buy his product because of that little plaque. If he wants to use it for advertising, he'll put it on the jerseys or on the race cars or whatever. The big distinction between philanthropy and sponsorship. And now we get to two interesting ones. Next one. Corporate social responsibility. Can somebody tell me the difference, and this is very important, between CSR and philanthropy? Because a lot of people get it wrong. Does anybody know? Otherwise we'll... Yes. What, 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 what? Core? No. Oh, I thought you got it. Your core area of activity. And it's core in this sense. And not in this sense. Core means the center of what you do, the main thing you do. I'll give you an example of a company uh, that a former student in this class works for called Strumpf. You've heard of it? Yes. Strumpf does, used to do sponsorship and philanthropy. They stopped. They only do CSR. I know that because I asked for some money and they said, we don't do that anymore. They, what's their area of activity, business students? What's their core area of activity? Food and beverages. And you could say also catering. Catering, food and beverages. So if you're going to get CSR support from them, it has to be in the area of food and beverages or catering. It can't be, for example, going on an excursion with my students or doing some project on trains in Lebanon. That's what, I, that's what I tried to get the money for. And they said, no, and I was really happy that I didn't get the money. Interestingly enough, I was happy that I didn't get the money because I found one company that's actually doing CSR correctly. Because when the Bloom Bank sponsors the marathon, they call it CSR. It's not. What would be a CSR project for a bank? Corporate social responsibility is giving back to the community from which you took things. So how does a bank give back to the community? What, what are microcredits? Does anybody know? Does anybody know of the concept of microcredits? Yes. Okay, okay, guys. When one person talks, that's not the cue for everybody else to have conversations. Please, yes. For example, in poor areas of Lebanon, which is basically most of the country, uh, which is the south, the Bekaa, and the north, uh, often a small amount of money, a couple hundred dollars, to buy some equipment can make the difference between being able to send your children to school or to have good health care or not, or to build onto your house, or to invest in your business. So microcredits are something that's been introduced in Lebanon by the banks, and that's CSR, because it's a financial institution giving back to society. And finally, we have social entrepreneurship. Can anybody tell me what that is? The engineering students said, I didn't think this was a business class. I thought this was a political science class. But I'll get, <laughs> I'll get back to the issue of stakeholders in a moment. What is social entrepreneurship? What is entrepreneurship? It's business. It's business. What's social business? OK, there's a, there's a store that sells, I keep on forgetting the name, it sells products uh, it's, it's a, it's a, I think it's a, a, ca a Catholic or a store. It has, uh, what's it? Is? I should write it down. Uh, it sells groceries and it's a grocery store and well, not co-op. Auxilia, yes. How how am I going to remember Auxilia? Each semester I forget it. Auxilia. Does it make a profit? No. And what does it do with the profit? 
What does Auxilia do with the profit? They help people. Okay, what is the logic behind social entrepreneurship? What is the one weakness of NGOs? NGOs are nonprofit. So where do they get their money? They can, if they have a lot of members, if NGOs have a lot of members, they can raise money through membership fees. Okay, if you have thousands of members, you can charge $25 a month and you can have lots of money. Let's say you don't have that. Where else can you get money? Someone said donations. What's the problem with donations for NGOs? If I, there's a saying in English, whoever pays the piper calls the tune. What does that mean? I mean, this, the person who pays the musicians decides which song they sing or song they play. So the person who donates money to the NGO controls them. And NGOs in Lebanon, Lebanese NGOs, where do they normally get their big donations from? Politicians, rich families in Lebanon, or company, or internationally from other NGOs or other governments. What's the problem when a, Le when a Lebanese human rights organization is getting most of its funding from Europe? They're controlling what the Lebanese organization is doing. Yes. Now that could be good, that could be bad, but it's definitely not independent. So what's the best way? If, if you don't have a couple hundred thousand members, or even a couple thousand members to pay, donation, to pay membership fees, what's the best way to make Money, not fundraising, not donation. Fundraising is good too, bake sales, whatever, right? Make a profit. Now, what's wrong with that? What's wrong with an NGO making a profit? I, let's, say, let's say I'm an NGO and I help people with disabilities. And I also make a profit. What are people going to say about me? He's making money off of the people with disabilities. How immoral. You can't make money off of people suffering. So f historically, people have been reluctant, if they're doing something good for society, to make money out of it. But, so it's a trade-off. It's one of those dilemmas. If you have no profitability, where, you, where will you get your funding, primarily? From donations, which makes you dependent on the donors. If you have a section of your organization which is a social enterprise, what can you do? You're totally independent of parties, rich families, banks, foreign organizations, which is good. But, of course, then you have the issue of making money. So, why am I listing these seven do-gooder approaches? Because these are ways that organizations interact with stakeholders. What are stakeholders? Okay, what is the difference? What is the difference between a stakeholder and a stock holder? Okay. Somebody in the back, what's the difference? Okay. okay, a stockholder is somebody who owns part of a public company. And as we know, public company does not mean government owned, it means owned by stakeholders, so stockholders, excuse me. They, what they've done is they've taken this term and they've sort of, you know, adapted it to give it a new spin. What does it mean to have a stake in something? To have an interest, okay. If they would build a, this is my dream, it's actually not, but imagine they would do this. Imagine they would build a second highway, that we have one along the coast. Imagine they go up, up the hill, let's say five or 10 kilometers, and build a super highway atop, across the top of the mountain. So everybody who lives in the mountains doesn't have to go down to the coast, along the coast, and back up the mountain. Would that be good for some people? Yes. 
Yeah. It would be good for some people. Who, let's say you live in Bikfaya and you want to go to Pumdun. What do you have to do? You can either go through the mountains, which is very beautiful, by the way. I've done it several times. Uh, or you go down, everybody who lives in Bikfaya, they go down to the coast, over to Beirut, in the traffic, back up to Pumdun, right? What if they build a highway through the mountains? Would that make the people in Bikfaya and Pumdun happy? Yes. So those stakeholders would say yes. Who would say no? Okay, it's not environmentally friendly, and if they build a highway through the mountains, they're going to have to take a lot of people's land away to build the highway. Who else is going to be unhappy? All those stores along the highway on the coast are going to lose a lot of traffic. So you get the point. Stakeholders can be all kinds of people that are in some way impacted by anything. So whether you're government, business, or civil society, when you make decisions according to this stakeholder principle, you should interact with those people who are being affected or impacted. Okay, so, and we, these, we'll, we'll go back to these seven examples, uh, but what is, the homework is to find one example for each one for Thursday. And hand them in with your name on it, please. So print it out again. Don't, if you've written on that, print it out again. I want a clean copy with an example. Uh, just name, yeah. It can, anywhere in the world. Anywhere in the world. Okay. Okay, a big, a big topic, guys. One example for each one, yes. So you need seven. Okay. Privatization. Privatization is on everybody's mind. Uh, does anybody remem remember Paris 3? I remember Paris 3 because in, when they announced Paris 3, there was a general strike. This is back in 2008. Were you old enough to remember that? Uh, this is a political science class, but I'm not supposed to talk about politics in this class, right? But I'll talk about my personal life. When I was told uh, in, February, in January of Tuesday that we're not allowed to go to work because we're all supposed to go on strike against Paris 3, I got up at 4 o'clock. This will make like a third of the class happy, right? And I came to work anyway, right? 4.30. 4 As I was coming here towards the highway, there were people burning tires. They were wearing orange. I don't know why. Uh, and they threw a big piece of concrete at me, but it was really big. So it didn't go very far. It just slid across the highway and hit my tire. Nothing happened, but I now had bragging rights that I could say they threw a piece of concrete at me and it hit my car. It wasn't that, so, true story, right? So I got here, nobody was here, right? Except a few people. One of my best friends in the humanity who, support, who supported the general strike, he said to me, oh, Haram, you can sleep at my house tonight. You can sleep at my house tonight, so I ended up sleeping here <laughs> in Balune. Okay. So, Paris 3, what was it about? Two things. VAT, increasing VAT, and ultimately a second issue, privatization. What is the ethics of privatization? in the reading. Which parties in Lebanon who are in parliament oppose privatization in principle? None of them. In principle. N yes. Wait, 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 quiet. Excuse me. Okay. What are we talking about here primarily? We're talking about what is not privatized? Water, and more importantly, electricity. All the parties in parliament support the idea of privatization. It's not whether you do it, it's how you do it. So, PPP stands for, bravo, a business student, right? Private public partnerships. One of the models is private-public partnerships, which mean, would mean that the electricity is 
run in combination and sooner or later either the public steps out or the private steps out. Or that goes on forever, private, public. Or we can have complete privatization. What is that? What's the problem if you give the corporations con complete control, no strings attached to the water and electricity? What will they do? Okay, back here, yes. They'll compete with each other. Okay, that's the theory. But who is going to suffer if we have unregulated privatization? Why? Okay, that's, but we're assuming there's going to be competition, right? If there's competition, there will be, there will be no monopolies. But what will companies do? Okay, those are monopolies. As long as we have competition, that's not going to happen. Where is it cheaper to deliver electricity and water? In Junia or up the top of the highest mountain in Lebanon? So what they're going to do is they're going to cut people off from water and electricity if they live in remote areas unless they pay higher prices. So what you, they'll do it with, if, if there's no regulation. This happened a lot in Latin America where the water was privatized and people who lived in remote areas out in the country, in the jungle, in the mountains, or who lived in poor parts of the cities who had very low incomes, who could not afford the higher prices, they were cut off. They cut their water off. So privatization, from an ethical perspective, has to have a certain level of regulation. That's the point that's being made here. And it's an important discussion for Lebanon. So when we talk about privatization, we should always have the ethical a consideration in there. So quickly now let's move on to following orders. We already talked about that with respect to duty. Remember? That was on page 11. Conflict of interest. Can someone give me an example from the real world of a conflict of interest? I mean you've read the homework. Raise your hand please. Whatever. Can someone give me an example of a conflict of interest? Okay, for example, some of you like to see action shows, action movies. My favorite one is 24 with, with uh, what's his name, Bauer? Jack Bauer, right? Did anybody see the last season of 24? No. Okay, in the last season of 24, the president, who's a woman, oh, yes, yes. 24 was ahead of its time. They all had a lot of black and female presidents before Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama. And the president's daughter commits murder. The president, as the executive, as the head of the country, has a right to pardon her. What does she do? She says, I'm not going to get involved in this. That would be a conflict of interest. Obviously, if I make the decision, I'm going to decide for my daughter. So she turns her over to the courts, because the courts should be unbiased. And of course, the courts sentence her to prison. She goes to prison for life. And of course, her husband's really angry at her and divorces her. So she pays a high price for the principle of conflict of interest. Normally, Judges, referees, anybody who's deciding on a case will not decide on a case if somebody who they know is being judged. Okay, conflict of interest. Very, a very clear concept, I think we can go over that. Whistleblowing we've dealt with. Now, these issues are very important, and I think that you'll probably have more of a, a more experience with this once you get into the business world, especially when you work with companies that are, are of an international nature. Okay, finally, this is the one chapter where you have a little glossary at the end. If you play, please look at 16. Please look at 16. Which is 153 in your reading. It's in my bag, okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah, got it. Okay, I put it in there because it was ringing. Okay, good. So, 
we have some terms here, co-optation. We didn't deal with that yet. What is co-optation? Uh, excuse me. Uh, when, a, when an organization or a group in society becomes very influential and they're not given any rights, what will they do? And they're not given any rights. They grow in strength and grow in numbers. They demand equal rights and they don't get that. What will they do? Revolution. There'll be a revolution. So what's the better option instead of waiting for them to rebel? Give them, that right. Give them equal rights. So co-optation, I mean, the, an example that is often used in the U.S. is the African-American population. We'll also deal with the black population in South Africa after the Civil War. South Africa is interesting in comparison to Lebanon because the history is very similar. But let's take, for example, everybody's darling Condoleezza Rice. Remember her? Yeah. Was, was she a big friend of the Middle East? No. <laughs> she, she wasn't generally disliked. Was it because she was black, a woman, or what she had, what she had to say? What she had to say. Good for you. Good for you. No racist or sexist in this class. Okay. Condoleezza Rice is not an example of co-optation. Co-optation is when the black population, as you probably know the history of Martin Luther King, the blacks did not have rights in the U.S. and they fought for their rights. We talked about Martin Luther King before. Gradually they were given their rights. What Condoleezza Rice is an example of is something else called, I know you guys are engineers and business students and this is pretty dense, right? But I think we can get it, okay. Um, some people when they have dinner and there's, my, my mother used to do, she still, she still does it, but she, she's very old now so I won't talk about her behind her back. She loves oyster filling. Filling is bread that you put inside ducks or geese and you put oysters in it. So whenever we would have oyster filling at Christmas, she would pick the oysters out of the filling. And everyone would go, hey, wait a second, we want the, some oysters too. Now we're going to get the filling and no, no oysters. If you have a birthday cake with candles and there are cherries on top of the birthday cake, what might a child do? Pick the cherries off the cake, right? And English being the language that it is, this is called cherry picking. And we're going to say cherry picking versus co-optation. And I'm going to give you two examples. One is Condoleezza Rice and one is Barack Obama. Both people you've heard of. Okay, Condoleezza Rice was chosen for her position in the Republican Party because of two things. One, she's really good, she's really smart, she's brilliant, a good administrator, but she was also chosen because the Republican Party had a bad reputation because they had too few women and too few blacks. So by choosing her, they could, they could solve two problems. One, they get a good person, good leader. Two, they could increase their blacks and women. She had no support from the African American community. She was cherry picked out of the African American community by the Republican Party, the party of George W. Bush. She was like a cherry on a cake. She was a delicacy because she was very good and she solved their problems, but she never had roots in her own organization. We see this, for example, it's political science class, I'm not going to talk about politics, but there are some Shia and some Armenians who support Mustakba. Right. Mustakba. Do they have a lot of power in their community? No. They are cherry picked to fill the gap. Does everybody understand the position, the point now? If an Armenian runs in Beirut or a Shia runs in the Bekaa on the list by Mustakbal and gets into parliament, do they have any power in their communities? No. Just like Condoleezza Rice had no power, has no power in the black community, in the African American community. Does everybody understand the concept? Yes. Co-optation is something else. Co-optation is the example of Barack Obama. When Barack Obama became president, 
the complexion of the White House changed dramatically. There were a lot more blacks. There were two groups that came in big time, people from Chicago, because anybody who's in politics knows that each party has its own regional groups, right? So parties that are, are across the entire country, there are people from the north, people from the south, people from Beirut, people from the Baca, and they all have their own power structures. So Barack Obama's Democratic Party organization in Chicago, they got a lot of, lot, lot of jobs because they're loyal to him. Democratic Party Chicago, he's a Democrat. He brought in a lot of blacks as well, African Americans. So, but, 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 but despite that, he had a lot of roots, he has a lot of support by African Americans. Condoleezza Rice has none. Barack Obama has almost complete support of his community, of his group, which is around 20% of the population. So you get the difference between co-optation and when, when, um, when uh, the PSP, when Wally Jumblat joins a coalition, is it cherry picking or co-optation? When Jumblat joins a coalition, does he bring his entire community with him? So what is it? It's co-optations. So either the eighth co-ops him or the 14th. The question is, was, is he being co-opted or is he, uh, <laughs> whatever, right? Okay, but you, I, I think everybody's got the, the uh, understands the difference between, so, good. Uh, deontology versus utilitarianism. Everybody understand that? We've gone, we've gone over it already. Deontology versus utilitarianism. We're finishing the chapter today. You got it, okay. Good. So, what's utilitarianism? Yeah. So we don't know, do we? Okay, good. <laughs> what's, uh, what's utilitarianism? So, good. Guys, when I ask, does everybody understand something and you say yes, that means everybody say moi, right? I used to be a tour guide and we get on the bus and I said, everybody on the bus? And there was usually somebody you know, in the back seat where it goes the whole way across. There would usually be somebody sitting back there who'd go, yes, which means I'm here, we can leave. So when I ask, does everybody to understand? If you don't, please ask me. So uh, take a guy. What's your name? Michel. Michel's a healthy young man. He has good liver, kidney, lung, heart, brain. He walks into a hospital and somebody's dying. And, this, and what, there's, there's five people dying. One person needs a heart, one person needs a kidney, one person needs a, a liver. So what do we do? We chop him into five parts. Five people live, one dies. Based on utilitarianism, that's a good thing. Because you... <laughs> Utilitarianism means the greatest amount of good for the greatest amount of people, full stop. Deontology is the exact opposite. Deontology says, no, human life is sacred. We wouldn't really care about Michel being chopped up, but because he's human, we protect him out of principle. Halas, okay, it's safe. someone's saving your life. Okay, you get the difference. Deontology means you do the right thing because it's the right thing, irrespective of consequences. Bravo. Okay, does everybody get that? Okay, good. I think we're getting... Uh, there's one thing that I, that I talked about that wasn't in the book that I think is very important to review before we finish this reading. It's the issue of universalist versus relativist. Can somebody give it a shot? What is the difference between universalism and relativism? Yes. You speak louder and everybody else is quiet. Okay. Which is a deontology. So deontological thinking is universalist.
So that would be an example of, an example of that would be utilitarianism. The circumstances, just the ends justify the means. Okay, good. We're now going to move on to the next reading, which you should not read for Thursday entirely. Uh, the next reading is taken from a book. It's page 2021. 20, Dag Hammarskjöld, Citizen of the World. Okay. This is a speech given to graduating students. So imagine this is your last semester at NDU. And for those of you who it is, now guys, shh. Imagine the General Secretary of the UN comes and gives the graduation speech. That's what you're reading right now, the graduation speech, but not in the very turbulent and uncertain times that we're living in today, but the very un turbulent and uncertain times 50 years ago, during what we call the Cold War. The Co Cold War, which was a, not a hot war in the sense there was no fighting, direct confrontation, between the Soviet Union and the US. The wars were plentiful, but they were not between the US and the Soviet Union. They were between what we call a proxy. What's a proxy? Somebody who does something for somebody else. For example, if I'm a member of a, corporate, of a company and I'm, I'm a member of the board, and I can't go for the vote, it's a very important vote, I can't go, so I send a, prox a representative, a proxy. So proxy wars were the wars which were taking place in the mainly former colonies, the countries that had been colonies up to World War II. Which countries were, give me an example of a country was a colony and then in World War II it stopped being one. Lebanon, Lebanon right? Syria, <laughs> Egypt. The whole, whole Middle East, all, most of Africa, uh, large parts of Asia, not Latin America because Latin America had become independent earlier. And when these countries became independent, guess what the Soviet Union wanted them to do? Be their allies. And guess what the U.S. wanted them to do? Be their allies. And so they'd fight it out in other people's countries. Sound familiar? when your neighbors are fighting it out in your country. Okay, so, still doing that. Okay, so proxy wars. So what we're dealing with here is a, a period which is not that un dissimilar to the world we're living in today. Whoever thought that the US and Russia would go to war? I mean, even a month ago, right? <laughs> so we're living in interesting times. The Chinese, the Chinese have a curse. May you live in interesting times. That's a curse, because interesting in that sense means like interesting, you know, like the way, the way life in Lebanon is interesting, right? It's very, yeah, okay. The point being, Dag Hammarskjöld is writing or is giving a speech to a group of graduating students like you in a university in the U.S. He's the general secretary, and he's giving them some tips about how to be an ethical leader. So you could say, well, that could apply to me as well. And one of the things he's doing is he's talking now about the, the issue of virtue. He's not, he doesn't use the word post-conventional, but this is a classical example of an ethical leader talking about how it's, one becomes a post-conventional leader in the Kohlbergian sense. So what I'd like you to do for Wednesday is just read the speech. The speech goes up until page 26. It's not very long. No. Okay. Okay, please calm down. Guys, there's 60 students in this room. We have to have some discipline. Uh, okay. What this, what this, what this, chapter does is one, it takes the speech, which you'll read for Thursday, and it analyzes it. 
So what I want you to do for next Tuesday is read the rest of the chapter, which is an analysis. We've already met Dag Hammarskjöld, and we've compared one aspect of his thinking to Martin Luther King, Franco Bernabe, and Frank Buchmann. What is it? What aspect of his thinking? Inner, inner dialogue. Inner dialogue. Inner dialogue is the way he describes what you should do to prepare yourself for ethical leadership. Uh, so what I'd like you to do for Thursday, for Thursday is read the big speech. For, for next Tuesday, finish it. And now I'm going to give you a little bit of an introduction. Guys, we still have some time. A little bit of an introduction to the setting. For those of you who, who are not political science students, which is almost everybody, uh, the Cold War, what, what was the cause of the Cold War? Okay, why were, why, why was there, okay, excuse me, please. Raise your hands and one person at a time. Why was there no Cold War before World War II? Was, was, was that the only, the, 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 the presence of nuclear weapons, is that the reason for the Cold War? No, no. Okay. Bravo. Are you an engineer? Because no, engineers are often good. Engineers are often good in lots of things, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> I'm, okay. Calm down. Calm down. Okay. The point being, guys. The point being that the world was bipolar. What was happening was in World in World War One, and again in World War Two. We had a multiplicity of great powers. After World War II, we had two superpowers. Today, we're back to great powers. There's a whole bunch of parties fighting it out now in the ring. So in that period, the whole, the whole point was that the entire world was supposed to line up behind Moscow or line up behind Washington. And so if you didn't, you were making them both angry at you. You weren't making any friends by being neutral, like Switzerland or Sweden. So this is the first issue. The second issue is that, as I mentioned previously, up until World War II, the majority of the world's population was not independent. What were they? They were colonies. Even a country like China, which was formerly not a colony, was controlled largely, even before the Japanese invasion, by European powers. So the majority of the world's population was dominated by a very f small handful of countries, which would have been Britain, France, most importantly, those two, as well as countries like the Netherlands, Belgium. Germany lost its colonies in World War I, as did, as did uh, Austria. Italy won, but they had very few colonies in the first place. What happens in World War II is that the push for independence is linked to many things, but one of them is support for the war effort. The British colonial people expect, once the British win the war, that as in return for their, their support of Britain in the war, they will gain their independence. independence. That was not a formal promise, but that was an assumption. After World War II, we have a whole series of wars. The one that you're probably most familiar with in the Arab world, a massive war of independence in the Arab world. Which country? Yeah. Algeria in the 1960s. A, a, a brutal, bloody, I mean, talk about uh, you know, collateral damage. The, the Algerian war was one of the war of independence, one of the most bloody wars of independence in the entire world. So, obviously once these countries become independent, the Soviet Union and the US, who are both not historical colonial powers, hope that they join them. So what Dag, Dag Hammarskjöld is attempting to do is to offer a third way. An option that is not 
being subjugated under the control of the Soviet Union, an option to not be under the control of the United States and its allies, but a voice that's independent. Now that n never really succeeded, but he was on his way to do that. And there's a lot of speculation that this is one of the reasons why his plane crashed, but we cannot prove that. Perhaps, perhaps. I mean, as good Lebanese, you would assume that they both got together and decided to take care of that problem. <laughs> anyway, so we don't know. But the, the issue here is, how can this Swedish guy be a global independent voice? Okay, he's from Sweden. So if he's, if he's from Sweden, he has what kind of experience? What would, what would, what would uh, Kohlberg say about him? What, what kind of ethics does he definitely have? Well, you just said that Sweden was liberal, so he would be... But if he grew up in Sweden, what kind of context did he grow up in? Did he grow up in a world... <laughs> no, on an ethical level. We talked about two types of assumptions. Either rule of law or culture of impunity. Culture of impunity. Obviously rule of law. Where would he experience rule of law and where would he experience being rewarded when he's good and punished when he's bad? Give, run through his life. Starting where? Before that. Family. Then. School. Then. That's university. Okay, school, university. Work. Where else? Politics. Politics. Okay, let, how about religion? Also, okay. So, let's get an idea of where he comes from. He is a Swede, which means the majority population there is Christian, and the majority of the Christians are Protestants. So he grows up in a strong Protestant tradition. So, does that make him sort of a global person or very limited in his pr outlook? You would say, well, he's limited. He's, he's for him, being Protestant is normal. Everybody's Protestant. Okay, what else does he do? He, he lives in Sweden, so which parties are there in Sweden? Does anyone know? Which parties are the, are the typical parties in Europe? There's, there's two. The, so, the socialists and the conservatives. Some, some countries have parties that are actually called conservative, like the Conservative Party in the UK. In the continent, they're called Christian Democratic Parties. They're conservative parties with a slight uh, slant towards religion, basically in their history. Who's the Chancellor of Germany? Angela Merkel, head of the Christian Democratic Party. She's, she brags about having, going, having had gone to church for decades. How can someone who hasn't gone to church for decades be the head of the Christian Democratic Party? It's not that Christian anymore. It's, it's, it's traditions, okay. The conservative bloc and the social democratic socialist bloc. Which party rules France? The socialist party. So whether it's socialist, social democrat, labor party in the UK. In Scandinavia, the tradition is socialist. And he was a socialist. So what do we have so far? He's a devout Protestant Christian and he's a Marxist. Does that work? He's a devout Protestant Christian and he's a Marxist. Yes, no, it works? Yes, no. Okay, hold that thought. Hold that thought. Okay, it works. Somebody wants to know that, have that work. Okay. <laughs> okay. Third issue. Where does he get his job experience? Before he was in the UN, he had to work somewhere. Historically, the UN does not usually recruit people for their top positions who go up through the ranks of the UN. They, they choose them from somewhere else. And his history, his background, his work experience, his track record, his job was working for the Swedish government. If you work for the Swedish government, are you experiencing rule of law or culture of impunity? Rule of law. Rule of law, okay. So this guy, this guy who's, who you're reading, he has three strong personal experiences that mold him. One, his very strong Christian faith. Protestant, but not that far from Catholic or Orthodox. Second, his experience 
in the Socialist Party. The Socialist Party is known for being the supporter, the champion of which group in society? The people. The people? The, the workers, the people who have jobs, as opposed to people who have companies, who own companies. So he's got a strong social justice and equality bend to him. He has a strong Christian background, and he has a strong level of experience in expecting that rules are, are respected. If it's, if it's a rule, you do it. So, is this the world we live in? No, no. The world we live in, is it more rule of law or culture of impunity? Culture, culture of impunity. So, right there we're going to see that there's a, there's a clash between the world and the General Secretary of the UN. So what the whole article is about, is about several things, but one of the major issues is can you be a global leader or an international leader? Is the, word, the word global is also a relatively modern term. Back then we used to say international. Can you be a global leader and maintain your ethics on a personal level? And what he's saying is that's the only way to do it. The only way to be global is to be personal. Now that sounds like a contradiction in terms. Yes, global and personal. It sounds like a contradiction. But let's think about it. We have enough stuff now to, guys, we have enough stuff now to actually start working with this. Where do you get your post-conventional ethics from? From religion? politics, work, which all goes into making your personal ethics. So if you're going to try to have an ethical approach on the global level, where are you going to get it from? Your background. So what we're going to see is he's describing, it's a personal story. How did I, as Doug Hammerskjold, and he's relatively successful in his day, how did I succeed in trying to introduce a global approach to ethics, and he says, very simple, by being very personal, by going back to my, cat, my Christian, socialist, and public administration roots and applying them to the global level. So that's the first thing that I want you to pay attention to. He also talks about the type of person who achieves this. He uses the term, ma maturity so why, of mind. So pay attention to this. What you have to do is constantly, and this is for all of you now who want to have leadership responsibilities, you have to constantly work on yourself. There's no such thing as arriving at ethics, arriving at democracy, arriving at freedom. It's a constant struggle throughout your life. And it's a constant attempt to become more mature on an intellectual, and he would also say being a Christian, spiritual level. And finally, we have what we talked about before, the use of inner dialogue. It's a tool. Inner dialogue is like training for the football team. It's a skill, it's a thing you do. And what, did, what do we know about exercising? What's the best way to exercise? moderately every day, right? So that's, the, that's also the key then for inner dialogue, or what Martin Luther King calls self-purification, Barnabe calls solitudine. There's a handout, right? It's on Facebook and Blackboard. And, and uh, IFC calls calls OK, thank you. See you on Thursday.